Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming this morning. I'm going to talk about pericarditis and hopefully share something that we can all learn from. Um, my objectives today include, uh, we'll look at the etiology and the epidemiology, especially we'll focus on the idiopathic uh, cause. We'll look at the diagnosis, how we can use clinical criteria and then use advanced imaging. We'll look at the complications and the treatment, including some novel therapies, and we'll spend some time on constriction. Now, uh, one of the things about pericarditis is that in terms of cardiovascular disease, it is something with very low mortality, but very high morbidity. And the push right now, or at least for the past two decades, has primarily been decreasing mortality uh, in terms of cardiovascular disease. So pericarditis has garnered relatively little attention. And then now as mortality has decreased, morbidity has become more important. And that's why there's more and more interest in this condition. Now with uh, pericardium, it is double sac. It contains the heart and roots of the gray vessels and also the vena cava. There's the visceral pericardium, which essentially is the epicardium. And then you have the parietal, which is the fibrous layer. It fixed the heart to the mediastinum. It's less than three millimeter thick uh, using cardiac MR. It's well innervated. The inflammation triggers pain. Now, what exactly is the purpose of the pericardium? Well, we're not sure. Uh, it contains some fluid. Does it lubricate the heart maybe? Does it facilitate cardiac chamber coupling, protect a skin infection? We know it's not essential uh, for cardiac function because there are uh, incidents where patients have either complete or partial absence of the pericardium. This, for example, right here is a cardiac MR axial image using the HACE sequence. Let's see if I can bring out a pointer here. So the myocardium is gray. This is the LV, this is the RV. Fat is bright. You can see this pencil thin there where the red arrow is pointed. This is the pericardium, okay? You can see here, this is the epicardial fat and that's the pericardial fat. But anatomical study though suggests the parietal pericardium is actually less than a millimeter thick. And the issue is, do we overestimate by MR? Now, if it's a millimeter, then we're pushing against the spatial resolution of cardiac MR. In certain sequences, you can get some artifact, uh, increases the, the appear, uh, thickness of the pericardium. At times, as I illustrated to you, the normal pericardium is very, very thin, sometimes actually difficult to visualize. And actually it's brought out if you have a lot of pericardial and epicardial fat, or if pericardial effusion is present, that would be helpful. Now, when you have markedly thickened pericardium, it's evident on MR and CT. Now, most patients that come in with pericarditis has a very benign course. And when they are treated with NSAIDs, the symptoms will resolve within days, two weeks. The significant minority, however, can develop recurrence and it can be debilitated by kind of recurrent attacks. So in modern literature, what we found is that in developed countries, about 70 to 80% of the pericarditis are idiopathic. Most of the time they're preceded by some type of a viral prodrome, whether it's flu, uh, upper respiratory, uh, or uh, 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 GI-like illness. Now about 5% of the emissions uh, from the ER is secondary to pericarditis. Now when we query the Optum Insurance Database, what we found is that about 76% of the pericarditis are idiopathic in nature. So this agrees with the modern literature quite well. We also see a seasonal pattern and there's a distinct late winter peak uh, with pericarditis. So it's consistent with some type of viral infection. When it comes to recurrence, however, we do not see that uh, seasonal pattern. So suggestive is probably some type of immunogenic background or could it be incomplete treatment, not the viral infection itself, by the inflammation. Now, as we put in more and more devices and more and more procedure, post-cardiac injury has become uh, more prevalent uh, as a cause of pericarditis. And traditionally, we think about a post-pericardiotomy with surgery, uh, bypass valves and so on. Post-traumatic uh, uh, is primarily iatrogenic now, as we put in uh, pacemakers, ablation, TAVI, and so on. Uh, infarcts can be a cause, but that's become less and less common as the push for early revascularization and the size of infarct has continued to decrease. Now we presume the uh, pericarditis secondary to injury is still immunogenic, 
uh, in etiology. And the reason is because the injury can occur and it can actually be a latency period for a week or two weeks. So it's actually not an injury itself per se that leads to pericarditis. The overall complication rates are still low. Again, it depends on etiology, but in general, it's still low. The treatment approach to post-cardiac injury pericarditis is about the same, again, often with lower dose of NSAIDs uh, and also coaches, in part just because patients often are on antiplatelets or on anticoagulants already. So there is ESC guidelines that help us make the diagnosis using clinical criteria. And in general, we talk about pericarditis pain, something that's pruritic, something that's sharp, uh, something that gets better if you sit up or lean forward, uh, presence of a rub, um, EKG changes with ST elevation, PR depression, about 60% of patients will have this, and also presence of pericardial effusion. The idea is use two out of four criteria or satisfy two out of four criteria for the diagnosis. And other supportive things such as inflammatory markers, CRP, ESR, white count, and also use imaging to look at a pericardium, which we will go over. Now, traditionally using uh, simple things, uh, cheap uh, EKG, you get ST elevation and PR depression. It actually does evolve with time. The, the PR depression goes down and ST elevation decreases as well. And then they actually go into a T-way inversion pattern which is actually uh, uh, similar to a post-infarct type of pattern. Now, if you have ST elevation and PR depression, it is quite specific uh, for pericarditis. Not very sensitive, but quite specific. Uh, this is an example of two patients that have classic pericarditis symptoms. If you look at the top EKG, there's diffuse ST elevation throughout. On the bottom left, there's a C elevation and some PR depression, although not quite as prominent as the other EKG. In terms of biomarker, there's nothing specific for pericarditis itself. Now, it is an inflammatory condition, so ESR and CRP has been looked at quite a bit. In patient that comes in within the first 48 hours, if they did not receive anti-inflammatories, about 80% of the patient will have elevated markers. Um, bizarrely, the study actually look at uh, if you check it twice. So once it's not enough, if you check CRP twice, and then if you do that and they haven't received NSAIDs, less than 5% will actually have pericarditis. So uh, less than 5% will actually have a normal CRP. So if you have pericarditis, if you check CRP twice, or the likelihood that if you have pericarditis with a normal, well, if you have normal uh, CRP, then it's unlikely you have pericarditis. Now, obviously, this is a really a clinical uh, disease. So using our uh, minds to assess uh, the presence is important. Troponin is obviously obtained and appropriate. So in most patients that come in with pericarditis, as you have ST elevations and so on, about 30% will actually have troponin elevation, and this is likely due to extension to the epicardium. It's not like acute coronary syndrome. This is not correlated as a prognostic indicator, so higher troponin level doesn't mean worse prognosis. And it, the concentration does correlate with magnitude of ST elevation. There's a small study that came from Italy looking at patients who had troponin elevation versus those who had normal troponin. And the overall recurrence rate of pericarditis is the same. The other complications are so low uh, in both groups, but overall the complication rate is low. Now, um, we see this not too uh, for infrequently. When patients get admitted to the hospital with pericarditis, we start going down the path of workup as to what else can cause pericarditis. And in general, we should look at an epi epidemiologic background to determine how far you want to go. In the United States, since we're a developed country, really routine identification of the putative virus is unnecessary. And there are multiple viruses that involve in the cold and GI illnesses. And, and we can see this when we start a search, it's often very, very exhaustive and it doesn't change the prognosis and it doesn't change the management. In fact, there's actually not a correlation between serum viral titer and patient that who actually undergo biopsy or pericardial synthesis a PCR analysis from those fluid doesn't correlate with the viral titer uh, in the serum. Also, uh, we often see ANA testing is obtained uh, in acute inflammatory conditions. ANA is often positive, although in relatively low titers. 
again, you can imagine we go down that route, you go through a really unnecessary workup. So as I said, the um, pericarditis really should be a clinical diagnosis. So in addition to a good clinical exam, there are some supportive findings. So we usually will get an EKG, echo to rule out pericardial effusion, inflammatory markers such as CRP, ESR, and troponin should be obtained in all patients that come in with ST elevations. Now, if uh, MRI is obtained, multiple sequences are done. And you can see right here, this is something called T1 weighted imaging. This is a black blood sequence. This orientation is coronal. So this is the left ventricle. This is aorta coming out. SVC right here that goes into right atrium. This is a uh, black blood sequence where fat is actually bright. So you can see this is fat right here. This is epicardial fat. And this delineates the, the pericardium quite well. So this is the pulmonary artery. This right here is the pericardium. You can see it kind of surrounds the heart. We also use what's called T2-weighted image, which is a water-based sequence. We're looking for edema. This is exactly the same orientation as the T1-weighted image. This is the left ventricle. That's the aorta. This is the cavity. The fat that you see here is subtracted out using this sequence, so it's black. And you can see this bright lining right here. It's edematous, and that's the pericardium. It's bright when there's water. Now, in general, a normal pericardium is really not vascular at all. Uh, when you have increased inflammation, there's increased neovascularization. So we'll see increased blood flow to the pericardium. And with that, we will see gadolinium uptake. So this is a patient that come in with pericarditis, short axis view. The myocardium should be black. The cavity is this kind of grayish color. And if there's uptake of gadolinium in the pericardium, this is what you see, this very bright rim of tissue surrounding the entire heart. And just for comparison, this is something that has no pericarditis, and you can see there's no rim around it. This right here, just some epicardial fat. We also do the traditional kind of workhorse sequence of uh, MRI. And this is uh, SSFP CINE imaging uh, without contrast. And we use this to assess ventricular function to look for size of pericardial effusion. And this is a patient who has a large pericardial effusion. I'm not sure this will uh, continue play for me. But I think it's obvious uh, the heart was swinging in there. You can see ventricular size and function. Now, for most patients, uh, the diagnosis treatment of pericarditis can be done as an outpatient. The overall uh, risk is low, um, and most patients can be treated with NSAIDs. However, there is some risk factors or some predictors of poor prognosis, and these kind of include fever, uh, large pericardial effusion, tympanot, that's not surprising, lack of response to uh, conventional treatment, and also when there's subacute and onset. Now, when we said predictors of poor prognosis, poor prognosis usually means there's increasing risk of short-term complications and likelihood of certain diseases beyond viral pericarditis, such as autoimmune diseases. Tempana is pretty rare, about 1% of patients with pericarditis. Now, if it's gonna happen, it happened early on in the disease as well. The treatment for pericarditis, for acute pericarditis, really is NSAIDs and colchicine. Now, the dose are a little bit different than what we use to treat a headache. Now, with aspirin, we usually talk about, since we have 325 milligram doses in the U.S., we usually talk about three tablets every eight hours. And then the, dose usually, the treatment is usually for a week to two weeks, and then we taper. With ibuprofen, we usually talk about 600 to 800 milligrams a day for the same uh, three times a day, excuse me, for the same duration, and then the taper. With colchicine, in the U.S., most patients will be getting a twice a day in terms of the weight-based approach. Um, tapering is not clear-cut as to whether it's helpful, but most of us do. And you go down to once a day and then perhaps uh, every other day for a week or so. Now, in addition to pharmacologic therapy, it's important that we exercise restricted patients. Uh, for athletes, uh, the ESC guideline, and we're talking about professional athletes, they should stop exercise for three months. For the general population, uh, there's not clear guidelines, but probably stop uh, for a few weeks until patients certainly has remission and their inflammatory markers are normalized. The multiple trials that actually look at colchicine uh, for both acute and recurrent pericarditis, it does cut down the recurrence rate by about 50%. It also decreased the time 
that it would take for patient to achieve remission or uh, symptom, being symptom free. The biggest side effect cogency is GI, mostly related to diarrhea, which is weight based. Overall, otherwise, it's well tolerated. The side effect is probably 5 to 10% of individuals that take it. Some trials shows that really it's not much different than the placebo. In terms of myocardial involvement, the definition is not exactly clear. Uh, do we define this as being troponin is elevated, LV dysfunction, or do we do MR on patients? But the modern literature suggests about 15% of the patient does have myocardial involvement, and this is terminology-wise, it's called myopericarditis. It's primarily pericarditis with some myocardial involvement. The reverse would be uh, perimyocarditis. If patients come in with mostly myocarditis uh, with some pericardial involvement. And really, MR is the way to confirm the diagnosis. In patients that doesn't have LV dysfunction, the treatment approach is the same with NSAIDs, but maybe a lower dose. There were some animal models that actually show with myocarditis, if you treat uh, with high NSAIDs and uh, colchicine, it may actually increase mortality. Again, these are animal models and didn't really translate uh, into the human population. And there's really not a lot of study looking at this. Uh, There's a small study a couple of years ago looking at 45 patients that were confirmed to have mild pericarditis with cardiac MR. Some of them were treated with high dose NSAIDs and others did not. They found there's no major differences or there's no difference in terms of uh, adverse cardiovascular uh, events. So this, for example, is a cardiac MR with a patient that came in with myocarditis. Again, on the left is the CINE imaging, bright blood without contrast. You can see function is normal. There's no uh, segmental wall motion. Right here, you can see this is a patient with the LGE sequence. Whoop, go back. So the myocardium should be black. You can see here, there's delay enhancement in the epicardium. And that's it. Oh, boy. Then there's delay enhanced myocardium in the pericardium as well. So this is myopericarditis. Now, not all pericarditis is just straightforward. So this is a patient, a 30-year-old woman who came in with ST elevations and PR depression. Classic patient you think uh, would be viral pericarditis. Her troponin was up to 4.7. Uh, her white count was 18,000. She does have a family history of premature coronary artery disease. And then two months ago, uh, she had pneumonia and was treated uh, with antibiotics and then her symptoms resolved. Let me see if I can play this again here. I'll play this here so you can see that. So you can see uh, function is normal but there's kind of a subtle area, maybe wall motion right here in the basal lateral wall. And you can actually see it best in the short axis view, there's a hinge point there. Uh, let me uh, go back to the slideshow here. And we did a sequence, something called high TI imaging. And what we did is we give contrast. Sorry about that. We give contrast. And the myocardium here should be gray, and you can see this uh, grayish color throughout. Again, three chamber view, grayish color. But then there's this area of black here, area of black. And that's what's called microvascular obstruction. And what it is is you have all these cellular debris that clog up the, uh, uh, the uh, vessels where the gadolinium can even get to that area. So this is essentially nascent in a, in a no reflow uh, from the cath lab in that, in that sense. Now, this patient did undergo coronary angiography. They did, some find, they did find some plaque, but there's no uh, uh, epicardial or culprit uh, disease. This is the LGE sequence. Again, the myocardium should be black here. So again, black is normal. You can see very prominently the pericardium light up. Same thing here in the four chamber view. Short axis view, the entire area. is lit up. So there's pericardial inflammation but this area right here, infarction with microvascular obstruction. So this patient actually has post-infarct pericarditis, and this just emphasized the importance of cardiac MR in a situation like this, where a patient come in with classic pericarditis symptoms and who have troponin elevation. Now, how sensitive is MR in the diagnosis of pericarditis? And well, we don't really know. 
Now, um, we know that um, pericarditis is a clinical diagnosis and their ESC guidelines. Uh, there's a small study that came from Mayo where they look at surgically proven patients who went to the OWA and they have surgically proven pericardial disease. And of those who have recurrent pericarditis, 94% have LGE on the pericardium. This is obviously a unique population. Most patients who has acute or recurrent pericarditis don't end up in the operating room. But again, this is some of the small data that we have. Recently from Italy, uh, they compared cardiac MR uh, to the ESC guidelines. So really we'll compare to an imperfect gold standard, but that's some data we have to kind of compare MR. We're looking at pericarditis. When they use the presence of pericardial edema, which is using T2-weighted imaging, and also LGE, what they found is that the positive predictive value is very, very robust. So the specificity is really high. In terms of sensitivity, you know, it's somewhat borderline. But again, this is an imperfect gold standard that we're comparing to. When it comes to terminology, uh, talking of acute versus recurrent pericarditis, uh, acute we usually talk about four to six weeks. Recurrent, usually what we mean is they have an acute episode. Uh, they have remission, typically four to six weeks, and then they recur. Again, this is arbitrary. And we talked about incessant as uh, over four to six weeks and chronic being over uh, three months. And obviously there's a lot of overlap when it come, comes to the diseases like this. Recurrent pericarditis, again, we talked about it seems to not have a seasonal pattern, so it's presumed to be immune-mediated as opposed to a reinfection with the virus. The factors associated with increased recurrence including uh, previous steroid use, uh, female gender, and also who has had frequent uh, recurrences in the past are more likely to have it again. So if we look at, again, the uh, Optum Insurance Database, in patient who has a diagnosis of pericarditis, where we have more than four years of follow-up, about 36%, 36% has more than four recurrence and 10% actually, oh, I'm sorry, 36% has more than two recurrence, 10% actually has more than four recurrences. And within those four years, most recurrences happen in the first year, but again, 15% have recurrence four years out. So you can see that this is something that it can happen over and over again, and it can happen years down from the index episode. Now again, with pericarditis, typically uh, it can be treated and can be managed uh, and diagnosed as an outpatient, but about 15% will have myocardial involvement. Again, the definition is not exactly clear. Of those 30% of the patient who has the initial episode will have recurrence. And as the data shown, about 10% can actually have more than four recurrences. About 1% can get tamponade. 30% can get troponin elevation, which should be assessed by MR. The exact uh, frequency of uh, reverse, reversible uh, constriction is unclear. It's not uncommon someone came in with acute pericarditis who had no symptoms of constriction we do cardiac imaging such as MR, you actually see uh, ventricular interdependence. They have no symptoms of heart failure. And most of the time in these patients, just anecdotally, is that once the pericardial inflammation result, either based on symptoms or based on MR, the ventricular interdependence will resolve as well. Small percentage will get constriction or chronic constriction, about 1%. In that situation, CT should be performed to look for calcification. The treatment for recurrence really is exactly the same as for uh, initial episode with the difference in terms of the duration. Now we'll be talking about treating for weeks uh, to months with the same medication. If steroids are used, should be used by a low dose uh, weight-based sequence. Now traditionally we talk about a milligram per kilogram. The symptom will resolve really quick. However, the side effect is high and the recurrence rate is also high with a higher dose and faster taper. So when we use it, typically we talk about 0.25 to 0.5 milligrams per day. When we taper to about 10 to 15 milligrams, that's when recurrence are most likely to happen. So the taper should slow down uh, even more. And side effect, again, of NSAIDs and coaches, you know, discussed. With steroids, again, the recurrence is high over fourfold especially when we use on the post. So if it's used alone without coaching or other NSAIDs. So again, the tapering should be slow and we should use a low dose. 
So we recurrence uh, based on the insurance database that we query. We know it's a high disease burden. A patient could have uh, episodes four years uh, down the line or longer. Uh, they can get debilitating chest pain and patient gets fear of recurrences and a significant side effect with kind of conventional treatment that we have. So how can we kind of break this cycle of high dose NSAIDs and steroids and is there something else that we can use? And that's kind of what led to uh, uh, the uh, investigation into a medication called Rolanacept. But kind of before we talked about that, we need to have some basic understanding of the inflammatory pathway. And my kind of simple understanding of this is when you get pericardial damage, there's release of what's called pathogen-associated or damage-associated molecular pattern. That will then lead to the release of a lot of cytokines, and interleukin-1 is one of them. And previous kind of laboratory study has shown that interleukin-1 kind of mediates the pathophysiology of recurrent pericarditis. So with interleukin-1, they bind to their receptor, and it kind of stimulates more release of interleukin-1, so kind of creates a self-perpetuating cycle of inflammation. Now we know that steroids, uh, NSAIDs, aspirin, and colchicine, they kind of interrupt the inflammatory pathway uh, in different areas. And the idea is that can we uh, interrupt uh, uh, interleukin-1 and see if that can uh, suppress uh, recurrent pericarditis. And that's where we start looking at something called Rolanacept. And this is a uh, interleukin-1 alpha and beta receptor decoy. Essentially, it soaks up interleukin-1. Currently, it's actually approved for a family of condition called CAPS or cryopyrin-associated periodic syndrome. This is a it's a very rare condition where a patient actually has an overproduction of interleukin-1. So it's an auto-inflammatory condition. And with relanacept, it actually soaks up the interleukin-1 and decreases the inflammatory uh, response in this group of uh, patients. And with that idea, we participated in a phase two study. Um, and thanks to Christine and, and Dr. Sharkey, who were uh, instrumental in having the study here. Uh, this is a study where we look at primarily patients who have acute pericarditis, okay, uh, they're symptomatic, have elevated CRP. And the second group is patients who has uh, post-pericardiology syndrome, again, with acute episode. And these patients received the medication. A total of 25 patients uh, were uh, enrolled, and this is a multi-center study. Patient received uh, Rolanacept for six weeks. And they, six weeks, and they have the option of uh, participating in the extension period, which is 18 weeks. Now, um, we were the first to enroll, actually, uh, uh, in this trial, and we have the second largest volume uh, in the study as well. What we found is that the patient who received the medication, they have a very rapid and sustained and meaningful decrease in their CRP and also their symptoms. And this often happens just after the first dose. And if you look at the purple line here, this is their CRP level. So their mean CRP was over four, oops, excuse me, over four. And after the dose, after the first dose, it decreased relatively quickly. And when they remain on the medication, they remain in a normal range. And these are patients that came in with acute pericarditis with elevated CRP. We also look at their pain score using, oh, sorry about that, kind of a numerical rating system. And again, when they first came in, and this is the gray line here, when they first came in, their uh, uh, pain score is over four. And again, with Rolanacept, it, Rolanacept, it dropped pretty quickly, and they were able to maintain at a low level while they uh, were maintaining um, the medication. <laughs> with the patient that are on steroids, 13 patients were on steroids when they enrolled. And uh, 11 of them was able to discontinue uh, steroids altogether. Two of them, the dose were tapered uh, to a relatively low dose. And while the patient were weaned off steroids or weaned down the dose, they have no recurrence of pericarditis. And the uh, dose of steroids has, did not have to be increased in any of the patients. Um, of the patients who were corticosteroids dependent, so we had two arms where they were corticosteroid dependent. They did not have pericarditis at time of enrollment. Uh, but these are patients where attempts were made to taper the steroids and they keep having recurrences. Of those patients, uh, their CRP level were not high on enrollment, but we were able to get them off steroids and their CRP level, and again, this is the purple line, remained low throughout the study. 
their kind of pain score were not very high on enrollment. Again, these are quiescent patients on steroids. And when we taper them off the steroids on the medication on Relanacep, uh, their uh, numeric pain score remained low, meaning there's no recurrence of pericarditis while they were on the medication and were tapered off steroids. We also look at kind of the global health score, both uh, physical and mental health. Normal in the United States is 50. Uh, higher the score, the better. And other patients that enrolled, they all had low score. These are acute pericarditis patients or corticosteroid dependent patients. And at the end of the treatment, their score is increased to 50 or above. So it kind of normalizes. Uh, other corticosteroid dependent patients, the changes were not as dramatic, but certainly the score went up as well. This is the first patient that enrolled in our phase two study. Again, this is the cardiac MRI. You can see the patient had a large pericardial effusion. The heart is kind of swinging in there. With the LGE sequence, you can see uh, the pericardium lineup, the scatolinium contrast here. Uh, you can see it in the parietal pericardium, in the visceral pericardium as well. And this is a huge pericardial effusion. Same thing in short axis view. You can see the pericardium lights up. This is after a patient completed the trial. There's essentially no pericardial effusion. You can see there's minimal pericardial delay in Hansen, if any at all. So in summary, in terms of the uh, Rolanoseb, we know that patients had rapid improvement in terms of their symptoms, and we can use that based on the uh, numeric rating score, uh, their quality of life. And also we know the other clinical manifestations such as CRP, looking at size of pericardial effusion and pericardial delay enhancement, they respond quickly and they persist while they're on the medication. It allows us to discontinue or taper down steroids. And the idea is possibly that we can obviate the use of steroids completely in patients who come in with recurrent episodes of pericarditis. And with the encouraging results, phase three study, actually it's just the enrollment just closed. And again, we were the first to enroll and we have the second highest volume. And this is a multi-center trial, international trial actually, including Italy, um, Australia, and also Israel. And this particular uh, study look at patients who come in with acute recurrent pericarditis. The etiology could be post-pericardiotomy, could be injury. And most of them obviously would still be idiopathic. Upon enrollment, all patients receive the medication. It's a subcutaneous injection. You give it once a week. After um, about 10 weeks, patients are then randomized in a double-blinded fashion to either placebo or to the medication. Um, and we know that the side effect profile is quite good. Uh, the biggest side effect is really injection side reaction, and most of them are mild. While actually awaiting the results, uh, from the phase three trial as the, the enrollment just closed. Now, beyond the traditional immunosuppression or NSAIDs, um, these medicine, the biologic are used really sparingly. Uh, there's another one called Enokinra, which is an interleukin-1 beta uh, receptor antagonist, uh, just beta alone, uh, not alpha. And this is medication that's initially actually used for rheumatoid arthritis. And with other biologically, uh, biologics that came out uh, was a medication that's looking for another home. And they found it in uh, pericarditis. And a small study they look at uh, was done again in Italy, looking at patients who have recurrent pericarditis are steroid dependent and really resistant to uh, colchicine. Again, 20 patients really, up to 10 that's uh, receiving the medication, they're much less likely to have recurrence. They stay in remission. And of the patients that who receive placebo, they recur uh, relatively quickly uh, and frequently. We know the patients that receive this medication do respond. However, the optimal duration is unknown. The dosing is daily. And subsequently, after the uh, trial ended, it was found that recurrence is not uncommon. So although patients respond, they do recur. Now, beyond immune, uh, immunotherapy and biologic and so on, they are a group of patients that will continue to have pericarditis, and pericardiectomy is an option, although uh, it should not be jumped to right away. And now, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about constriction here. Uh, it's relatively uncommon. It's obviously the, the uh, complication that's most feared uh, in patients who have pericarditis. The, in, the important thing to know, the incidence is actually related more to etiology and not the number of episodes of pericarditis. Intuitively, you think that 
if you have five episodes of pericarditis, you're more likely to have constriction than the patient who had two episodes, and it's not. Again, it's more related to etiology, such as radiation or TB, um, TB being the most common in developing uh, countries. Um, the presentation in general is uh, heart failure, um, fatigue, and some nonspecific symptoms. It's important to know as well, about 20% of the patients who have constriction do not have thickened pericardium. Now, this is a patient that came in with actually constriction symptoms. You can see here there's loculated pericardial effusion. This is, again, this SSFT Cine imaging, bright blood, no contrast, function is normal. And I think if you look at a short axis view, you can see there's a funny septal bounce of the, per, of the um, septum. These are, again, the T1 and T2 weighted imaging. Remember, T1 is a black blood sequence, allow you to delineate the pericardium. And you can see right here, this is thickened pericardium. In the short axis view, you can see it's circumferential. And these are fat around the corners. This is epicardial fat around the uh, right ventricle. T2 weighted imaging, looking for edema again. The fat is subtracted, so you can see fat here being black, fat being black here. You can see this rim of bright tissue right here, rim of bright tissue. Again, that's edema of the pericardium. Another sequence we can use is something called post-contrast gradient echo cine imaging. And remember, we discussed that in normal pericardium, there's really an absence of uh, vasculature in the pericardium. However, with uh, inflammation, there's neovascularization and increased blood flow. Let me see if I can play this here. And you can see right here, uh, you can see there's a little funny septal bounce on the Cine imaging. And then again, there's this bright rim of tissue and that's pericardial inflammation is very clearly shown here in the short axis view. Again, uh, this is someone who had evidence of constriction uh, as well as acute inflammation. This is the late gallinium sequence. Again, myocardium should be black. And here myocardium is black. And this is short axis view from base to the mid-ventricular level. You can see uptake of gadolinium throughout the pericardium from base all the way to the mid-level of the ventricle of the heart. So we looked at edema. We look at anatomy in terms of thickness of the pericardium. Physiology could be identified uh, using MR as well, something called uh, real-time imaging. So we're looking for ventricular interdependence. So this is the diaphragm here. You can watch it go up and down. So as the patient inspires, the diaphragm drops. You can see the ventricular septum shift over to the left ventricle. Again, breathe in, septum shift over. And there's a uh, whoops, correlate, whoops, let me go back here, uh, an echocardiography correlate using a tissue Doppler. So you can see the tissue Doppler here in the medial side of the left ventricle. Uh, it's much higher uh, than the lateral, and the reason is because the lateral wall is tethered uh, by the thickened, or doesn't have to be thickened, but tethered by the pericardium. So it can occur, as I say, even with normal pericardial thickness. It can be transient, and that's the thing to remember. Um, usually defined as a new onset within six months, especially if you have elevated CRP and if you see delay enhancement on MR or edema on T1-weighted imaging. The trial of anti-inflammatories is important in this patient instead of going straight to pericardiectomy. It can persist in patients who have a, a large pericardial effusion. And if it happened, this is what we define as effusive constrictive. Permanent cases, obviously, uh, surgical periarch cardiectomy is the, uh, is the uh, solution. And again, in these patients, CT should be performed to look for calcification. Sorry, I kind of went through everything relatively fast, but in summary, uh, acute pericarditis is self-limited. It's mostly viral in etiology. Recurrence is common, and it can occur, year, it can occur years down the line with a significant morbidity. Troponin elevation is not associated with worse outcome. But if, uh, if, if patient had elevated troponin, uh, cardiac MR should be performed uh, looking for alternative causes and also looking for myocardial involvement. NSAID and colchicine in the first line therapy. 
Steroids can be used, but it is a risk factor for recurrence and should be avoided if we can. And when used, it should be low dose weight based and the taper should be very gradual. Rolanacept is a biological and interleukin-1 alpha and beta receptor decoy. It has been uh, shown a promising result in a phase two study and we're waiting uh, for the phase three um, results. Constriction can be transient and it warrant a trial medical therapy first, especially if you see evidence of inflammation, elevated markers, uh, delay enhancement on MR. Constriction can occur without increased pericardial thickness. And MR is an excellent tool uh, to help you uh, in the diagnosis of uh, pericarditis or constriction uh, beyond the clinical uh, criteria. And the ESC guideline is actually a very, very good reference uh, in terms of the management and also the diagnosis of pericardial disease. Okay, thank you very much. I wonder if you and maybe Katja and Peter could comment about whether these interleukin antagonists might also work in myocarditis. Is there any, is there any evidence for that? When you see these troponin elevations, and you know, if you once you go down the MR, uh, do an MRI, and then you find delayed enhancement in the uh, in a non-vascular distribution, you start to get into now. What do I do? Territory, and I'm just curious as to what your perspective is on that. It's a good question. I have no idea. I've never heard of that, but it makes sense. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You've stumped us. There is, uh, actually, there is a trial of using a lot of stuff in, in myocarditis associated with human And so it makes you start to wonder okay, is, is there some mechanism of other acute yeah, yeah one, one of the challenges with this, you know, even the question about is there a role for steroids and, you know, there have been some myocarditis trial networks and they've had a heck of a time enrolling, and, you know, end up with 15 patients over five years. And it's a, it's a rare enough condition. It's been tough to study. There probably is more out there. And I think, you know, those trials were done before MR was widely available. So I suspect that there's more out there now than there used to be. Uh, or at least more that's recognized and diagnosed, but it's been a challenge to study it, and, and I think that's probably why it's been a lower research priority. So, okay, beautifully done, very clear. I, we have a common scenario where people have chronic chest pain, and they come for an MRI or some other test to rule out pericarditis as an etiology. How, if you have a completely normal MRI in that setting, how secure are you? I know you showed some sensitivity to yeah, I, I think uh, the important is that really we need to combine uh, with really your clinical suspicion. And part of that is because right now we just simply do not have a gold standard where we can reliably say, okay, if this is it, then we can rule out pericarditis. So I think it's a combination of what your clinical suspicion here. And if their inflammatory markers are pretty normal and their CRP is, and, and their, their MR is normal, I think we could be pretty confident that it's not pericarditis. But unfortunately, it's not a gold standard or a, a perfect gold standard, let's put it that way. So, okay. Great, great talk. I was wondering if you're in your clinical trials, have you had patients with other concomitant inflammatory conditions that, and that when they got treated, did those symptoms get better as well? Yeah, so intentionally, all those patients were excluded. Okay, so none of the patients that had auto inflammatory condition, especially if they're on biologic or on for whatever reason. Now, it's possible we end up enrolling without knowing, but I think it's unlikely because they undergo a pretty extensive workup for autoimmune diseases and intentionally we excluded those patients. Hey, okay, so great talk. Um, so I have a question about invasive hemodynamics and CMR. I, I will say, obviously, I'm not an MRI reader, but that, you know, that balance or that uh, was, in, you know, it was pretty, um, subtle, you know, when you showed right to the diaphragm. So is there any correlation? You know, we often get like that report, you know, IV constructed pericarditis, you know. So 
um, any correlation between CMR and invasive hemodynamics? Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm not sure there's a study comparison to say how sensitive it is. I'm going to get definitive answers from you guys a lot of times, and we send them to the cath lab, and we kind of struggle with that quite a bit. You know, I was just say, John, qualitatively, what you're doing is just increasing volume. And so you're making the assumption that they're low volume, but it could be brought out with inspiration. Most of the time, when it's overt, then it's at rest. We can have trouble with the right heart, though. A lot of issues with that. Yep. Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, speaking along the same line, I think uh, echo is uh, incredibly important for this diagnosis. These patients can be somewhat, it's kind of a, a cult diagnosis sometimes in people. The sonographer sees that septal shift or that, that, that shudder of a septum, and they run a longer beat run, like six or seven beats with the respirometer, and you can really pick it up. If you don't see it or you're somewhat suspicious of it, you can do, you can basically have to do a leg raise on the patient while you're imaging them. And that will bring out the septal shutter, that septal bounce. And if you put that together with an elevated CVP and that E prime velocity being higher medially than laterally, you're pretty much making a pretty pretty good diagnosis. Yeah, no, and, and what I'm trying to say is that, and, and don't get me wrong, I think all the tool we have is useful in making the diagnosis. But I think, you know, MR is not something we do, you know, on every single floor. Um, so I want to emphasize, though, with MR, what you can see is, number one, you can determine acuity. You can look for inflammation. You can see pericardial thickness. Number two, you can do physiology. Okay, so, and we can see the ventricular interdependence very clearly. You can, we can acquire for 30 beats if we need to, 100 beats. We can see the, uh, their diaphragm moving up and down. Okay. And three, so, so you can look at other things. Did a patient have sternotomy in the past and so on? So I think all the tools together, we can make the diagnosis of constriction a lot easier. Uh, so I think, yeah, echo should be done. I think if echo shows it, MR should definitely be performed as well. I think if you have, if you have the technology to do it and you're good at it, well, we should do it. So it's a combination approach. Thank you very much. Thank you.